Hey there, it's Jason Falls. If your company or maybe one of your clients sells to marketers, you look for advertising channels that guarantee business marketers are paying attention, right? Let me introduce you to the Marketing Podcast Network. You're listening to it right now. It's a network of podcasts all about marketing. So 100% of MPN's audience are marketers. Reach them by advertising on the Marketing Podcast Network. Learn more and find our media kit at marketingpodcasts.net. On this episode of Winfluence. Behavioral scientists are studying why people do what they do. And what they're finding is that over the millennia, the human brain has evolved to conserve mental energy. And as a result, humans have developed certain automatic, instinctive, reflexive behaviors. And essentially, you know, we cruise along through life on autopilot. And when we encounter a certain situation, we just default to these hardwired behaviors, giving them little, if any, thought. So that can be gold for a marketer to get out in front of that and to trigger some of these automatic behaviors. There's a difference between being an influencer and actually influencing. I'm Jason Falls, and in this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate that difference. Welcome to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. When you pull back from the narrow focus of influence and influence marketing and look at marketing and advertising overall, the linchpin to being successful in any of this stuff we call a job or career is understanding consumers. The first rule of any type of communications is to know your audience. If you don't know them or don't start there, you're creating a long way to the goal rather than an efficient one. But it's more than just understanding where they live, how much money they make, their gender, age, and ethnicity. To be really good at persuading an audience to take action, you also have to understand their behavior, their psychology, and as much as you can, get in their heads. Nancy Harhut studies human behavior. Her background, though, is in the advertising world. She spent time at Mullen and Hill Holiday, among others, in the Boston area. She's been a creative director, which may sound nothing like studying human behavior, but the best creatives know that topic is at the front of their mind because it better informs their creative ideas. Nancy has a new book out called Using Behavioral Science in Marketing. It's actually refreshing to see a book about understanding consumers' brains coming from someone other than a researcher or scientist, though I do love me some Roger Dooley and Martin Lindstrom. I asked Nancy to join us to talk about human behavior through the eyes of a marketing creative person to uncover how those insights can help creators, agencies, and brands in the influence space and beyond. So today on Winfluence, we're going to pick Nancy's brain about picking consumers' brains. And I promise that's as graphic as the show will get. This is the point in the program where I tell you a little about Tagger, our presenting sponsor. It is a complete influencer marketing software package I use every day to find, engage, hire, collaborate, review, and measure all my influence marketing efforts. Thanks to Tagger's new signals feature, I can actually start my influencer discovery process very differently. In signals, you do enter your topic or keyword, but instead of getting influencer recommendations based on maybe how many times that word appears in someone's bio or content, you actually start with a list of creators already actively talking about that topic. It's a social listening piece that zeroes in on the influencers already engaged around the topic, so your outreach is more relevant. Seriously, if an influencer said trash bags in a post four years ago, they might come up in a regular influencer marketing discovery search that, say, hefty might do. But in Tagger's signals, you get the people who mention trash bags in their posts or content over the last 30 days or whatever time frame you choose. This gives you more relevant creators already teed up to discuss the topics around your brand. I could go on, but you know I use Tagger every day. You should check it out, too. It might be right for your brand or agency. Go to jasonfalls.co slash Tagger to get a free demo and see if Tagger is right for you. That URL again, jasonfalls.co slash Tagger. How can we all use understanding human behavior in our marketing efforts? Nancy Harhut will explain. She's next on Winfluence. LinkedIn believes B2B marketing can be B2 brilliant, B2 bold, and B2 breakthrough. How? With a platform purpose built to make B2B mean more for your business. A platform with tools to help you build better relationships with your key customers, 
to boost your buyer journey while building your brand. A platform with the trusted data and lead generation you need to beat KPIs, drive ROI, and stand out amongst the competition. And with the targeting tools on LinkedIn, you can reach your precise audience right down to their job title, company name, location, and more to make sure your ads are always being seen by those who matter. So get ready to be to boldly go where no marketers have gone before. Because LinkedIn is where B2B is everything it can be. Rethink your B2B marketing LinkedIn ads and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash MPN to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash MPN. Terms and conditions apply. Nancy, I've always been fascinated by the exploration of behavioral science. I think if I had a little bit more of a left brain sensibility, I probably would have gravitated towards studying human behavior a bit more, perhaps even beyond graduate level studies. But, you know, in the marketing space, I'm a big fan of folks like Roger Dooley and Martin Lindstrom, some of the others in our space that have tried to translate brain science into information that marketers can use. And your effort in your new book is certainly no less impressive. I guess my first question for you is, If we all know that understanding human behavior makes us more well-informed marketers, why don't we pay more attention to it? That's a great question. So I think, honestly, that behavioral science is a little bit new to marketing, despite the fabulous work that people like Roger Dooley and Robert Cialdini and people like that are doing. It's still kind of new. And when you start to get into it, you say, oh, my gosh, it is tailor-made for marketing because behavioral science is all about the study of why people do what they do. Marketers, of course, are trying to get people to do certain things. So it's a marriage made in heaven. And yet, a lot of times, I think marketers just aren't tuned into it or they're beginning to. I shouldn't say that they're not, but they're slowly starting to get tuned into it. And I think sometimes we just, you know, we're cruising along, we're doing things the way we used to do them, we're happy enough with the results, and it doesn't occur to us that maybe we should be doing something differently. And then when it does occur to us to do something differently, very often we look to technology. And not that there's anything wrong with technology, but for my money, I'd rather look at human behavior and the crazy decision-making shortcuts people use and the decision defaults that they rely on, because I think we can get more bang for our buck that way. You're absolutely right. So I guess, you know, marketing, whether it's influencer marketing, which is a lot of what I talk about here, or influence marketing without the R, or traditional advertising, public relations beyond, all of it works better the more you understand your audience. But it's far more than demographics. Why is behavioral science perhaps more important than the -the run-of-the-mill market research we're all used to seeing. So I think that the demographics, the psychographics, the -the run-of-the-mill research is certainly helpful. But where behavioral science adds to that is behavioral scientists are studying why people do what they do. And what they're finding is that over the millennia, the human brain has evolved to conserve mental energy. And as a result, humans have developed certain automatic, instinctive, reflexive behaviors. And essentially, we cruise along through life on autopilot. And when we encounter a certain situation, we just default to these hardwired behaviors, giving them little, if any, thought. So that can be gold for a marketer to get out in front of that and to trigger some of these automatic behaviors. You know, if we know, for example, that if you put uh, two options in front of someone, as opposed to one option, people are more apt to make a buying decision with the two options. For a marketer, that's like, oh my gosh, let's put two options in front of them. Whereas in the past, we might have said, well, we've got the perfect thing. The data is telling us that this is the right marketing message for this particular target. So we're going to just put it in front of them. Here's the product that you should be getting, Jason. It's perfect for you. But if I give you a choice of two, you're much more likely to make a decision than not. So knowing how to trigger these automatic hardwired behaviors is really incredibly helpful for marketers. Yeah. You know, it is really counterintuitive because if you're given the choice of do you want to buy this or not, or if you're given the choice of do you want to buy item A or item B, the statistics tell you that people buy more of item A and B combined than they would buy of the one item alone. It seems counterintuitive, but that's the way the brain works, I guess. Yeah, it does seem counterintuitive, but I think what happens is the question goes from do I or do I not want this to which of these two do I want? That's kind of what happens, you know, but you would think, no, I mean, as you said, counterintuitive, someone's going to want it or they're not going to want it. What difference does it make if there's another option, but it does make a difference? You're absolutely right. Well, yeah, it takes away the option of not buying it at all. It's like, do you want one or two? It's not, do you want none? And so that's... It's funny how the brain works. So I guess we should start with the two sides, if you will, of everyone's brain. And I don't mean right and left, 
There's the rational side and the emotional side. Where are the buying decisions made? So the buying decisions are happening on the emotional side, and then they're later justified with the rational side. And so what happens is people make the buying decision for emotional reasons. They justify that decision to themselves as well as to other people with the rational reason. So from a marketing perspective, what that says to us as marketers is we want both emotional and rational components to our messages. We want that emotion there to prompt people to make the decision. And then we want to supply the things that they can point to, justify it, to rationalize it. There was a researcher named Antonio Damasio, and he studied people who had sustained injury to the parts of their brain that control emotion, what he found was they were virtually impossible, or they found it virtually impossible to make a decision. They were virtually incapable of making a decision, even a decision as simple as, what would you like for lunch today? They would go around and around and around. They couldn't land. So we really need, as people, to access the emotional parts of our brain. So from a marketing perspective, that means we want emotion as well as rational selling points. So what what I just pulled out of that, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I asked my daughter in a few minutes what she wants to do for dinner, if she can't make up her mind, it's because she's got brain damage. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, I'm sure there would be many other explanations for why someone can't make up their mind, but uh, that's very funny. I'm going to use that against her, though. That's what, Nancy Hart had said this, and it's got to be true. So you got brain damage. There you go. That's That's my thing. <laughs> So what are some of the ways through advertising and marketing and and maybe even some social media marketing that a brand or to our point, a brand working with or through a content creator, what are some ways that they can try to impact that emotional response? What are some best practices here for marketers to look for? Sure. So I think there's, you know, there's a few of them. If you're trying to influence behavior, one thing that we can look towards is the notion of social proof. When people are uncertain of what decision to make, they look to others, they follow their lead. So if we can talk about the number of other people who've already made the same decision we're asking you to make, if we can use customer testimonials or we can flag something as popular or fast growing, that's a good thing to do because again, when people aren't certain of what to do, they look to others, they follow their lead. Now, the flip side of that or the opposite side of that is there are times when people don't want to follow the crowd. You know, on the one hand, it can make you feel comfortable, safe. You're not going to make a decision. Someone else has already done this, so you can be pretty confident it'll work out for you. But on the other hand, there are times when people want to stand out from the crowd. They don't Mm -hmm. want to think of themselves as, oh, I'm doing what everyone else is doing. They want to be the first to know something, the first to do something. So when that happens, then we want to look at scarcity, the idea of exclusivity, and the idea that not everyone else has done this. You're one of the first, or you are the first, or we have information that only you have, but not a lot of other people have, or you can get access that not everyone else has, or you can have first dibs on something. And that can be incredibly powerful. So those are just two of several different ways, many different ways, actually, that we can influence behavior, kind of applying what scientists have thought about human behavior in order to influence it. Well, and if the people out there listening are paying close enough attention, she mentioned scarcity, she mentioned social proof, And those happen to be two of Robert Cialdini's Principles of Persuasion, which when his original book, Influence, came out in 1984, there were six of them. They've been updated. Now there's seven of them. And let me see if I can get this right. I always muck this up because there's a seventh one now, and I forget what it is. But it's reciprocity, scarcity, authority, consistency, liking, social proof, and the new one is unity, which used to be consensus. So... Those are the two of the seven that you've already mentioned. But when you're thinking about some of those others, like, I mean, reciprocity, I think, is pretty easy for people to understand. I do something good for you. You're going to do something good for me. And so that's where coupons and things like that come into play. But for authority and consistency and maybe even unity, what are some examples of how that brain science applies in these marketing mechanisms? Sure. So with authority, we talked about social proof. It's like, I'm not sure what to do. I'll do what other people are doing. The other thing you do is when you're not sure what to do, you look at what an authority says, because ever since we were kids, we've been taught to recognize and respect authority. And if authority says we should do something, we usually do it. So if you can pull in, you know, an expert in the field who has endorsed you, if you can say that you're a member of the American Dental Association, or you got the good housekeeping seal of approval, or, you know, anything like that, it conveys a certain gravitas, a certain, you know, outside expert has approved this, and that's a good thing. We talked about authority. Uh, What was the other one you asked about? Consistency and unity are the ones I'm curious about. 
Yeah. So for consistency, what they found is if you can get someone to do something once, they're much more likely to do it a second time, a third time, a fourth time. And that's particularly true if the first ask is relatively small and even more so if the answer is somehow public. So what that means from a marketing perspective is start small. If you can get someone to like you on Facebook, if you can get them to comment on a video, if you can get them to maybe download a free white paper, relatively small, but then you can start to increase your asks until you get to the big one, which is, mm-hmm. hey, do some business with me, buy my product, sign up for my service. You know, So you just kind of start small and escalate those asks. And the idea of unity, which as you say, is Cialdini's newest one, is this notion that we have a tendency to say yes to people who are like us. So yeah. if there's something about the market or something about the salesperson that that you feel connected with. Maybe you come from the same town or you went to the same school or you're both ardent environmentalists. Or there's just that sense that we're in this together. I'm more likely to be influenced by and persuaded by somebody who's like me because of that sense of unity. So it can be pretty powerful. And there are other other ways that we can use behavioral science to trigger behavior that I'm not sure Robert Cialdini included in his book, but you think about something like availability bias, where people are likely to judge the incidence of something happening based on how readily they can recall an example. So after Hurricane Katrina, for example, flood insurance sales shot right up. <laughs> because it was like, yeah. oh my gosh, we need flood insurance. And they really increased. And then, you know, over time, as the memory of the hurricane and all the flooding that went with it receded, the number of flood insurance policies kind of dropped back to their original pre-Katrina base level. But when we're judging the likelihood of an event happening, the event is the product or service someone is selling, we think, well, I don't know, could I use that? Would it make sense? So if we can get them to think of a time in the past when if they'd had our product or service, it had been great for them, or if we can get them to imagine a time in the future when they could see themselves benefiting from it, it's a whole lot easier to get them to then say, oh yes, I think I'm going to need that. Yeah, that's a great point. And back to your point on unity, I love the way that he, Dr. Cialdini, kind of rephrased that because unity to me is the one, although you can use social proof and a couple of the other ones in there too, authority as well. Unity is the one that explains to me most best why influence marketing is so powerful because the influencer's audience sees a likeness in themselves in this particular content creator. That's why they follow them. That's why they're fascinated with their content, with their worldview, their perspective on things. And if brands understand that the unity is already there and partnering with that content creator just you know helps the brand go through that creator to that audience even easier than they would f- through other channels of marketing and advertising, that unity factor is really powerful And that's why I think influencer marketing works so well. We are diving into brain science with Nancy Harhut. Her new book is out and available all over the places. It's called, very simply, Using Behavioral Science in Marketing. There's links in the show notes at jasonfalls.com, but you can search for it on the Amazons and elsewhere as well. When we come back, I'm going to ask Nancy to put all this thinking through that filter of influence marketing a little bit and help us get smarter about what we do. Don't go away. How can you change the world? Build a company or establish an industry if no one knows you exist. Marketing makes you exist. The Space Marketing Podcast is where we explore marketing principles, strategies, and tactics through the lens of space. Join me, Izzy House, as we talk with industry professionals about their challenges and successes with marketing in the new space economy. Subscribe at spacemarketingpodcast.com or look for the Space Marketing Podcast wherever you listen. Welcome back to Winfluence. Nancy Harhut is here talking about her new book, Using Behavioral Science in Marketing. Nancy, we were talking about the principles of persuasion before the break. I'm curious if you think those people who have emerged as influencers have done so primarily because they inherently either know or at least instinctively leverage those principles, which then builds the audiences that, you know, we brands covet so much in working with them. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. And I suspect that the answer is both. You know, I think that some people just instinctively have a sense for what works or they stumble into it, not unlike traditional marketers. Mm -hmm. And others, I think, are students of the craft. They study the game, they find out, they do research and they, you know, they say, ah, I can use that. That applies. I'm going to adjust my approach based on this new information that I've obtained about behavioral science. So 
I think some people just naturally fall into it or serendipitously, serendipitously fall into it. And others, I think, make themselves smarter and more effective by actually studying it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's design a little litmus test for people here. Let's say that you are in charge of a brand and you're you're looking for content creators and influencers to work with on the social medias, or in my vernacular, the more right influencers to work with, because I think all influencers are right to some degree. But are there indicators that you can look for within an influencer's content, within their behavior, within how they engage with their audience? that illustrate that a content creator is, in fact, leveraging those principles of persuasion well? What are the signs we want to look for to say, ooh, that person gets it? Sure. I mean, there are a number, but I'll give you a few. Uh, Behavioral scientists have found that people are more likely to do what you ask them to do if you give them a reason why. So I would look for creators who include that reason why. And Mm. bonus points if in teeing up the reason why they use the word because, which has been identified by a Harvard University professor named Ellen Langer as an automatic compliance trigger. When we (laughs) see or hear the word because, we just start to agree before we've even processed the words that come after it. We're so used to whatever comes after the word because being a good legitimate reason that we're already agreeing, we're already complying or saying yes. So I would look for creators that remember to put in the reason why, you know, whether or not they use the word because they they could tee it up a different way. You know, they could say the reason is or due to or therefore or as a result. But having that reason why I think would be important. I would also look from a visual perspective, use of faces and eye contact because humans are hardwired to look at other people's faces, particularly their eyes. So I'd want to make sure that in videos, I was seeing that kind of eye contact, or I was at least seeing the strategic use of eye gaze where the creator might be looking at the product because humans will look at other humans' eyes or they'll follow their eye gaze. So I would look for things like that. If a creator were doing any kind of a before and after or cause and effect a video or posting some kind of content, the closer together the two items or the pictures of the items are, the stronger the relationship people will perceive there to be. So I would be looking for the creator to have those two things close together, not really far apart, not at one end of the page or the other, one end of the screen or the other, but really close because what that's conveying to the person watching or the person consuming the content is there's a very close relationship there. And as a result, the product is effective because of it. So I would look for things like that, that just indicate the creator knows their way around human behavior and is kind of pulling all the right levers That's good stuff. You know, I'm just curious because, you know, a lot of the things that you've talked about are tricks that some, you know, advertisers have used in, you know, more traditional advertising, which is very different than influencer marketing content and social media content. But I'm just curious from your perspective, why do you think influencer types, individual content creators are generally much better at attracting at and engaging audiences these days than brands are? Brands seem to like fumble over all this content creation stuff, especially in the social world, whereas the individual content creators seem to have much more success there. I wonder if there's something in the behavioral science, or maybe it's what we've been talking about already, that might be an answer to that question. Well, I think there's a certain authenticity when you're dealing with a creator and not with a brand. I think from the recipient's perspective, there's a a little bit of skepticism. The brand says something, we are a little bit more willing to write it off. It's like, well, of course they say their product is good. They're the manufacturer, you know, they have a vested interest in it. Whereas, you know, a creator, it's someone that's like me or someone that I like or someone that I admire. And so you're you're just more likely to take their word for it. I also think that there's a genuineness and authenticity and emotion that a creator can bring to the party that, you know, brands try to be emotional. Some of them are better than others. But if you've got, you know, somebody who's legitimately jazzed about a particular product or service, that comes through. You, you can't really fake that. And, and so I think people pick up on that. And so when influencers are, you know, legitimately interested in and, and embracing a particular product or service or brand, it comes through. And when people see that, they're like, hey, I, I'm feeling that's resonating with me. That person is like me. And there's an authenticity and, and a trust that kind of comes out of that. And I think that might be some of the reasons, at least, why brands maybe are stumbling a little bit, whereas the influencers are not. Sure. The book is called Using Behavioral Science in Marketing. And Nancy, where can people find you on the interwebs if they want to connect? And more importantly, where can they find this awesome book? 
So you can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook. The agency that I co-founded is called HBT Marketing. HBT stands for Human Behavior Triggers. And the agency website is HBT MKTG. We abbreviate marketing. So HBT MKTG.com. Lots of, you know, case studies and thought leadership information on the site. And the book, it was published by Kogan Page, so you can find it at Kogan Page. You can find it at Amazon, Target, Barnes & Noble, any place, you know, fine books are sold. Using behavioral science and marketing, drive customer action and loyalty by prompting instinctive responses. Awesome. Links will be in the show notes to all those places. Go get this, folks. It's well worth the time and cost investment to get smarter using brain science. Nancy, thanks for making our brains smarter today. Appreciate you being here. Jason, it was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Love me some behavioral science. You should certainly check out Nancy's book. We've got links to it in the show notes over at jasonfalls.com. Just click on articles up top and look for the podcast post with Nancy's smiling face. Good stuff. Kind of influencer marketing's little version of Mindhunter or Criminal Minds for those of you who watch those shows. Speaking of criminal, by the way, if you know someone who might enjoy this podcast but haven't told them about it, well, that should at least be a misdemeanor, right? Make your friends and colleagues smarter about influence marketing. Tell someone who might want to know more about it about this podcast and send them to winfluencepod.com or share a link to this episode on your social network of choice. If you have a moment, drop Winfluence a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. We are on them all. You can also help make a future episode of Winfluence Awesome. Ask your question about influence or influence marketing that you want my answer to or take on. Send an email to jasonfalls.com if you're feeling adventurous. Record a voice memo on your phone and email me that file. I'll let you ask the question right here on the show using that recording. Winfluence is a production of Falls and Partners. Technical production is by MPN Studios. Winfluence airs along the Marketing Podcast Network. Thanks for listening, folks. Let's talk again soon on Winfluence. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is an audio companion to my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my periodic newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. And if you need help with your influence marketing strategy, drop me a line at jason at jasonfalls.com. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. This podcast is part of the MPN, the Marketing Podcast Network. Another great MPN podcast you'll enjoy is PR Talk a show that digs into the modern side of public relations through interviews with thought leaders, authors, and the media on PR Talk with the Marketing Podcast Network. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.